Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Martin. I'm one of the league's lobbyists. And before I introduce our next presenter, uh, I just actually want to ask a little housekeeping. If you all would just take a minute and move in, in these front tables, we'd greatly appreciate it. There's two reasons. Uh, we're recording this uh, session and also just a great way to uh, come in, engage with our speaker, and very helpful. So thanks. Please just, yeah, take a minute to do that. Greatly appreciate it. Fill in these, these front seats as much as you can. So again, yeah, my name is Michael Martin, one of your league's lobbyists here. Um, and I'd like you to welcome this afternoon's breakout session, uh, Being Prepared for Violence at a Council and Public Meeting. And I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dan Brown. Mr. Brown is a law enforcement risk management consultant with CIS. So please, as you're making your way to the front, join me in welcoming Mr. Dan Brown. Thanks. Well, how are we doing? It's always great that you, have, that you have to be instructed to move up front because there's not a lot of people in here yet, but I'm keenly aware it's after lunch, it's on a Friday, and a lot of your peers have already left. Why? Because they're elected officials and they're just not getting paid a lot of money, right? So I get it. Um, I, uh, but I appreciate you being here, and we're, we're going to talk about some uncomfortable situations uh, today. And I want you to be aware that there's a couple of videos in here that might make you uncomfortable. And so, you know, that's, that's just my, my warning to you that um, when we talk about this subject matter, that it's very possible that it might make some of you uneasy. Uh, but nothing uh, graphic uh, to a point that uh, it, it might be disturbing. It's, um, we, we really, I really try to filter that out. Uh, so a little bit about me. I am a law enforcement risk management consultant for City County Insurance Services, uh, CIS, which uh, probably most of you uh, we insure, um, and my job is to go around uh, to the different law enforcement agencies that are our members, and I pace a lot, I'm sorry, I was a cop for a long time, I'll go to that in a minute. Um, uh, my job is to essentially uh, go out and do best practice assessments to make sure that uh, your uh, police departments and sheriff's offices are following best practices within our, our, our um, you know, within their industry. And uh, how I do that is really have a conversation um, with the law enforcement CEOs. And it really, you know, really kind of helps to mitigate potential risks, like a lot of driving incidents or a lot of, you know, these things that, that might really go on. So that's my job. My background is um, I was I'm from Arizona. Uh, originally. I did it backwards. I'm a retired cop from Arizona. I went in the Marine Corps. I was in the Marine Corps for six years. Uh, I then served in uh, a few agencies in the state of Arizona, uh, working my, my way up uh, to uh, police chief in a small uh, rural community in northeastern Arizona, St. John's, and then I went over to Winslow, and I was a police chief in Winslow, Arizona. For those of you that are Eagles fans, yes, that's the one we're talking about, and you are going to Thank me for having take it easy in the back of your head throughout this entire presentation, right? You're like, I remember that, yeah, yeah. Um, so a uh, great place to be, um, but I retired after six months. I was utterly bored, and I became a city manager in the bustling metropolis of Burns, Oregon. Everybody, anybody ever been there? You know where it's at because it's a blip on the radar or whatever. Eastern Oregon is like kind of a cool place to be. I live there now still. I really like that lifestyle because I ride motorcycles and I get to get out there and I get to have fun. But I travel a lot, so I get to see this beautiful state all the time. And I don't just work solely with law enforcement. That's my general job. But I'll go out to, like most recently, I was out in, in Cresswell and I did uh, active you know, threat training with their city staff. I uh, we went up to, to Umatilla County recently. We did active threat training. So there's a lot of training that I will do uh, you know, on behalf of our member cities and counties. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about active threats in a public meeting. Why do we have to talk about this? Because number one is exist. And really, some people suck. All right, I'm just going to throw it out there like that. Some people are mean. They show up with one thing in mind, is to cause havoc. 
cause havoc, right? And the very fact that you are here means that there's some interest because really the world can be a scary place. Not all of you have law enforcement at your fingertips all the time because you might come from a very small agency, or a very small city or community within our state. Uh, and so it's a very real threat. And not just within the meeting itself, but throughout the community because you are government. And there's a lot of anti-government sentiments in the United States right now. And the world is a violent place. And I'm not up here to scare you, I'm just giving you just facts, right? I'm not gonna take a political stance one way or the other because that's not what I do. What we're gonna do is if it comes to your doorstep, what are you going to do to stay alive? Right? What are you going to do to make sure that your constituents are safe? How can we prevent this from happening? Can you prevent it? So those are things that we like to talk about, and there's no easy answer. I'm going to give you a lot of suggestions. And we can what if things to, to, you know, to the, end of the in, end of time and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's gonna be a 100% right answer, but we're gonna to learn to really identify some threats, what we can do to help mitigate some of those threats if they come to you. And a lot of you know those hot button topics and you don't know what it's gonna be. Uh, let, well, let me put it this way. Let's say you fire a high level employee. Let's say you fire a police chief, it's very popular. You know the, as, how many city managers are in the room? Okay, good. Can you talk about personnel stuff? Even with your counsel, generally speaking? No, why? Because there's these things called employee rights. So a lot of times they go to, they go to elect officials. How many elected officials are in the room? Okay. You ever feel like, gosh, I wish I knew what was going on. And you always get bits and pieces of the story, but the city manager can't necessarily tell you what's happening. And they can't tell you what's happening because employee rights. You can go into an executive session, maybe to tell you about that, but the public doesn't have access to that. So they get mad. And let's say you had a high level official within the city that was very popular and there was some wrongdoing and now you have to terminate that individual. The city manager knows through an executive session, council can know, you can't share that information outside of there, but it can be very heated. And you can bet that the very next council meeting that you have, it's probably gonna be ugly. There's gonna be people coming to call the public and they're gonna be saying things and it can get very, very heated. You have to prepare for those things that are known. And there's things that are unknown, right? One of the most polarizing issues that I faced in the city of Burns was working with ODOT to change the lanes from four lanes to three because I'm an old cop, right? I was a motor cop, and I'm like, oh, this is gonna be safe. We're gonna have a designated left turn lane and all that. Oh, no. I mean, it was standing room only. They're like, we don't want, you're gonna stifle traffic. I'm like, it's freaking burns. What traffic? Okay, what, what are you talking about? It's gonna take a minute longer to get through town, you know? But that's a polarizing issue, and they didn't want change because somehow government was just shoving something down their throat, right? and people get heated beyond reason. So we look at, this. Is, I love this quote, because our, and when I say our, that's all of our first responsibility in the midst of violence is to prevent it from destroying us. You turn on the news this morning, what do you see? Violence. You see violence across the world, right? Can it hit our doorstep? It has, it absolutely has. Think 9-11. Think every time there's an active shooter. We have become numb to active shooter events. A month and a half ago, I was at Eagle Crest, and we had, um, I went to the FBI National Academy several years ago. It's a 10-week in, you know, in-service uh, academy done in Quantico with the FBI. And so all of the FBI National Academy graduates throughout the state of Oregon get together, retired or not, uh, if they can, and we do a refresher training. And they had active shooting. They had the El Paso sh uh, uh, active shooting event that was going on. 
uh, and we had a breakdown from that, also from the Route 91 shooting out of Las Vegas, and then the one from Bend. And I had never seen the video from Bend in the same way. And I can tell, do I have anybody from Bend in here? From Lapine. from Lapine, nearby, okay. I can tell you that the Bend Police Department did phenomenal because of their quick thinking and their reactionary skills. They ended an active, an active threat that could have been much more severe. How do you prepare for that? Well, the police officers, they can train for it. But what happens if somebody's mad at you and they come in to a council chamber? And I'm gonna, I, I, I scoured for some video that I'm going to show you in a minute, a minute of just that happening. And I want you to some, some, somehow put yourself in the shoes of what would it happen? What would happen? I'm the mayor. I'm the council president. I'm a council person. Maybe, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm within, you know, the county, I'm one of the commissioners. What would happen if this came to my doorstep? What am I going to do? So try to just for, for the, the sake of time, try to put yourself in the shoes of what would you do? Because unfortunately, we don't like to think about these things, but you have to think about them. Even if, you're not, even if you have no plans to ever want to go take karate or you ever want to do you know, any self-defense or whatever, you're in a position that's high profile and some people just don't like you because you're government. Out in Burns, I was able to work with you know, um, state, uh, uh, the, uh, the congressional directed spending, right? And uh, <clears throat> we got a $3.5 million dollar uh, congressional directed spending um, request that was uh, approved and it was very polarizing because it was through Senator Merkley's office and he's a Democrat and on Burns there's a lot of Republicans and so I had people come to my office going you should be fired for taking Democrat money look what are you talking about it's a water system it's your money it's everybody's money, and you should be saying thank you instead of this nonsense. And it's always that small percentage, right? Most people are like, yeah, that's great. But the most vocal critics are going to come out and say these negative things over something that simple and polarizing, which turned out to be, you know, it's, it's going to be a wonderful thing for the community, period. That's it. You understand it. It's money. It's, it's, it, you're doing your job trying to get funding. You find it, and then you're going to get criticized. You can't do right, right? Uh, you can't do wrong, you can't do right, it's just all right there. Why do people get heated? Let's think children for a minute, and we can interact. If you, if you want to say something, please, by all means, do. Why do people get heated? Raise your hand, tell me, why? Lack of control. Lack of control, okay, lack of control. Why else? Yes? They're very compassionate. compassionate. Yeah, they're very passionate about their, about their feelings on the issue. OK. What's another reason? Yes, sir? Uh, sometimes people are just struggling in their own personal lives and want someone to blame. Some people are struggling in their personal lives, and they want someone to blame. What's another reason why somebody would come to a council meeting and be so heated? Yes? Yes, absolutely. Why else? They're what? You're hungry and tired. You're hungry and tired. Yeah, absolutely. That could absolutely be one. Yes. We feel they got screwed by the city. Court enforcement issue or you know false arrest or something. They they have a friendly something that the city got screwed. Right. Uh, up front, he said maybe they feel like they got screwed by the city. Maybe it's a code enforcement program. Maybe they got uh, maybe they got cited for some reason. Sometimes water rates. Right, you do a water rate study, and you have to increase water rates, and that becomes a polarizing. Why are you trying to do this to me, right? And it, it becomes economic. Why else? Mental health issues. Thank you. One in four Americans have mental health issues. That doesn't mean 
that one in four Americans are going to lash out and do that. That's what we're saying. And you might hear a few times me saying some, something about mental health. I'm not saying that in a negative way because so many people, so many people in this room alone suffer from mental health. It's completely normal, right? It's something that you normalize the fact that people suffer with, with different things. We, we have a very convoluted lifestyle. Some people with the mental health issues, they take it to, you know, untreated, take it to an extreme and we become in such heated, heated arguments. Now, I am no medical doctor. This next slide is actually from a school, a school curriculum for teachers that talks about the brain. And I just liked it a lot uh, simply because it's very, very simple. We have three aspects of the brain, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. And in that forebrain, or the prefrontal cortex, that's the part where you think. That's your rationale, right? You can, you can think critically, your critical thinking skills. You can problem solve through the prefrontal cortex. In the middle brain, this is the limbic system, right? That is where your emotions lie. Angry, upset, you're in love, right? Whatever it is, a lot of times that comes through your midbrain, the limbic system, and the brain stem in the amygdala, which is in your hindbrain, this is where when people become afraid or they become angry, they have the fight or flight. This, this is a survival portion of the brain. I thought that was important because that last one, that hindbrain, fight or flight during a meltdown the brain enters a survival mode. They become so incredibly angry that they cannot think rationally. You've seen people in your meetings like that? In other meetings? Somebody ever come into your office like that? Raise your hands if you've dealt with a difficult person that's been in meltdown mode. Right. Hopefully it's not in your household. Right? <laughs> Just kidding. Difficult people exist. And some of them are the very things you're talking about, sir, like the code enforcement issues. Some people see red. Like, I'm literally asking you to move your vehicle from the cities right away. We're just warning you. Oh, you have no right. Oh, I know my constitutional rights. And I want to say to them, and you probably do too, can you tell me what your rights are? Just where do they come from? Well, I don't know. Like the Bill of Rights, those things? Yeah. And sometimes I want to ask them, you know, I don't because it would be, you know, you know, make them angrier, right? But really, if you think about it, they're not thinking rationally. And when people don't think rationally, they become in a fight or flight mode. And when you're in a fight or flight, when that thinking shuts down, you either get so angry that all you want to do is lash out and fight, either physically or verbally, or you just want to flee the situation. And most people, if they come to your meetings and they're emotionally charged, they're not going to flee. They're going to stand there and fight it. They want to get the last word in, and you are trying to hold decorum. When someone gets to this cycle, think about a time that you yourself have been angry. I mean, so angry. Maybe you're not an angry person, but... Every one of us at some point in our life have been so ticked off about something that you're just seeing red, right? You start out calm. There's that trigger event, and I really have come to hate that word. I'm triggered. I'm triggered. I just, I don't know. Everything triggering the people, right? But there's a trigger event. There's a culmination. Something occurs to where I can't do this. I'm getting very angry. They become agitated. You can see their body language start to change. They might become defiant, crossing their arms, looking, shaking their head, clenching their jaws, clenching their fist. They're becoming agitated. Maybe they're starting to tap their foot. They're looking around to see who's around. You know that the average person is completely oblivious to threats completely oblivious to threats. 
If you ever wonder why police officers are so different in their thinking, is because they're trained that literally in the academy that everybody wants to kill them. It's not true, right? But what they're trying to do, what academy instructors try to do, is literally let them know that you have to be aware of your surroundings at all times. And the average person is not geared to have to feel that way. You're in your comfort zone, why? Because you go to work, a lot of you work in the same office. Many times you go to the same diner to eat. You work with the same people every day. And if something's off with some of your coworkers, you can tell because it's different. But generally, you leave, you go to your car that you know well, you take the same route home every day. You might look at the Waze app, you might listen to Siri if there's a wreck and it ticks you off because now it's five minutes longer to get to work, right? You go home, you insulate yourself inside your house, you might go for a walk, and if there's a dog that's at the loose, it's gonna tick you off because it's Japanese, your dog who's on the leash, right? These little things, but we're not really looking for threats because we want to think and believe that we are safe. And for the most part, we are. There's not a lot of people walking around that wants to do us harm. It's those that do that you have to be aware of. And you have to think there's something strange going on here. Someone is agitated they accelerate it to the point that they cannot function rationally and they're at a fever pitch peak and they're screaming and they might throw things, they might do things that otherwise this normal rational person would not do. And some of your constituents have yelled at you and you're like, I have dealt with the same person for five, 10 years, why are they acting this way? And some of you make the mistake that I can calm them down and I can do. You don't know what a person's going through personally, and you don't know the level of their mental health. And if it's deteriorating, you don't know sometimes if they're on substances that would alter the way that they see the world. Prescription drug use is the number one drug use in America. Not fentanyl, prescription drug use. De-escalation cycle comes in, and this is where you hear all the time, well, my officer's gone through de-escalation training. Have you? Have you, who's been through de-escalation training in here? That's, a, that's amazing. I'm glad to see that many hands. Because you, as elected officials or as city officials, you also need to know how to de-escalate, and many of you do without official training because most of you have the gift of gab and you got into positions because most of you are people, people persons, right? You know how to talk to people, you can read people, and that's good. But the de-escalation, we're gonna go into a little bit more, and then once they get out of this de-escalation cycle and they start de-escalating themselves, whether somebody else is assisting them or they just start cooling off, then they go into this post-crisis depletion. They're exhausted sometimes they start crying. You ever seen someone who's so angry and at the end of it they just break down and start crying? Yeah, that's that post-crisis depletion. And then the recovery, right? It's normal. It's, that's the normal cycle of the human psyche when they get really angry. Now I'm gonna show you the video, it's a little dated, but this is the one that I really want you to put yourself, this is a it's a school board meeting, right? It's a school board meeting. And uh, just, just watch it, it's actually, it's actually a pretty good video. And at the end, we're gonna talk about it. Put yourself, as you're sitting on the school board, what would you do? Police now know that Clay Duke had planned the attack at the school board building for some time. In his trailer, they found yesterday's date circled on a calendar. Now, a word of caution. Some of the following video may be disturbing. School board policy 7.3. From the moment, Clay Duke spray painted a V on the wall. People in the room sensed something ugly was about to happen. Then the ex con startled a routine meeting of the Bay District School Board again with a pistol. Everybody in this room hit the road. It was a nine millimeter, but it became a mazooka because that's where we looked at it. 
Duke cleared the room of everyone except the male members of the board. But watch Ginger Littleton, the only female board member, snuck back in and behind Duke and swatted at his gun with her purse. I don't think anything was going through my mind except for the fact that these guys were sitting ducks. Duke pointed his gun at Littleton's head, but never fired. Today, knowing she cheated death, she made light of it. Oh, yes, this is the purse. <laughs> Shall, I do? Shall I do my Vanna? We're going to put some bricks in it for her. I have three wonderful daughters, and they said, Mom, are you just stupid? What were you thinking? <laughs> Duke's major grievance was about his wife, a former teacher fired earlier this year. Fired all night. Superintendent Bill Husfeld tried to talk Duke down. He pleaded with the gunman to let the other board members go. I'm the one that signed the paper, right? Okay. I don't remember and I don't know who she is. But let them go. No luck. In hindsight, the V Duke had spray painted earlier stood for Vendetta, the logo of a movie about a mysterious man battling the government. The movie's characters filled Duke's Facebook page. Duke then got more ominous. I'm going to die today. Can you talk for me? No. Just Other board members also pleaded. I've got a lot with my wife and family. I don't need to die. But Duke was in no mood to listen. I've got a feeling that what you want is the cops come in and kill you because you're you're mad because you uh, said you're going to die anyway. But why? If this is this isn't worth it. This is a problem. Please don't. Please don't. Please. I'm going to kill you. He was going to do this. If you could have seen that gentleman's eyes, this was going to happen. Suddenly, it did. Gunshots, point-blank range, targeting Superintendent Husfeld. One hit my board book uh, and my papers on my desk. I was laying down, and it was probably inches from where I was laying. Incredibly, no one was hit. There is nothing short of a miracle that our superintendent is alive and well with us today. Alive because of Mike Jones, the school system chief of security and a former police officer. He came into the room and, off camera, fired at Duke. Duke fell wounded, the only person hit, and on the floor fired one final round, killing himself, ending the drama. I'm telling you, Mike saved our lives. There's no doubt in my mind that if he hadn't did what he did when he did, many of us would have not be here today. Late this afternoon, Mike Jones did show up here at the school board. Inside, he debriefed his bosses about what happened. He says he'll tell his story to the media tomorrow. And as you might imagine, the hometown hero got lots of hugs around here today. We also learned that 10 years ago, Jones was on the Oprah Show, honored for his work rebuilding bikes and toys for needy kids. His program is called Salvage Santa. The shooter, Clay Duke's widow, did speak today. She said that the world and the economy got the better of her husband. Katie? Mark Strassman, an incredible and terrifying story. Mark, thanks very much. OK, first I'd like to point out that is an old video because you would not see all that on today's news, right? You just wouldn't see like the gunshots going off. They did all that. But what's going through your mind? I'm sorry, speak up. Why wasn't somebody else open carry? Well, not everyone does, right? And sometimes there's rules, yeah. So I mean, it's kind of, I mean, obviously Oregon's an open carry. Uh, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into gun rights in here. Uh, but let's say, for the sake of argument, it doesn't appear like anybody other than the, the school um, police chief, right, had a gun, right? So that do doesn't look like anybody had a gun. Let's put that out, yes. Thank you. When the person was spray painting the wall, what was what were people doing and not like trying to intervene? Or that, that's a good question. Some people get stuck in wonder, right? They do. I mean, so somebody walks in. Is, is this an act? Is it theater? Is that real spray paint? What would you do? You're sitting. I've asked you. Who sits on a who, who's a, who's an elected official here? Raise your hand. Tell me, elected officials, what would you do? Call your police chief, right? What else? Yes in the back. I'd push the panic button. You'd push the panic button? Yeah, there's a panic button on the side of the chair. 
That's good, and that's excellent that you have a panic button. In fact, one of the things that at CIS we go through, we do security assessments for a lot of, of, of buildings, right? Uh, and I, I'll walk through and I'll look at things like panic buttons and do they actually work, right? Okay, what, what else? Yes, sir. Well, um, I'm probably thinking, it depends, I suppose, where I was in the room, but if I could, when he was, his back was to us, he spray painted, I jumped the son of a bitch and threw him to the ground with a couple of other people. I mean, act immediately. Don't wait for him to pull his gun out. When you know, okay, this guy's a threat, let's get him right now before he gets into his process. But you have to be careful. He's got his back, he's not looking at you, he doesn't see you, then you can jump him. I mean, the lady with the purse, the purse thing wasn't gonna work. But a couple of big guys could have jumped him when he didn't even know they were there. Well, and let's go back to the purse. First off, she kind of rocks. She's kind of my hero, right? Because the other guy just sat there. I mean, she's, she was the only lady on the board. And, and I mean, you know, I, I, kudos to her for doing something. A well orchestrated would have been, if she were to do that, to take him by surprise, maybe the gentleman could have jumped up and started fighting, right? But you're like, well, I've got a strained back. I've got this. What do I do? At the end of this training, I'm going to show you the video from the FBI of Run, Hide, Fight. I'm going to show you that. All right? So those of you going to say Run, run Hide, Fight, it, and th th that setting is actually in a bar. But again, it could happen anywhere. What I'm asking you to think about is, what would you do? Obviously, there was some shock. Is this real? Is it theater? And when it got down to it, one of the things is talking to people. The board superintendent took it. I was the one that signed it. And what did he say? I don't know who she is. And I don't remember. Did that just minimize it? Yeah, it minimized it, right? I mean, you're like going, hey, you don't even know who to, to, to this gentleman, his wife and her job was his whole world, right? They had finances. He had obviously had some mental health issues. And he said, I don't even know who she is. I signed the paper, okay. I don't know who she is. I don't know. Good thing to say, bad thing to say. Did it help? Okay. It's not, right? So uh, that, this is why I'm throwing this out. And I'm not, this was obviously a polarizing, scary situation that they never expected to happen. Let's move forward. I want you to think about your communication skills, your communication skills. Only 7% of communication that is effective is verbal. You know how you know this? How many people in the room are married? Right. And how many times have your spouse said, do you hear what I just said? You're hearing me, but you're not listening. Right? 93% of communication is not communicated by spoken words. I'm sorry? That's true, right? It's not, if, have you ever been talking to someone, they don't have to say a word, but you've already figured out how they feel about you? Or the situation? Yeah, you know. I mean, listen, I'm a son of a preacher, okay? And I used to laugh in church, I was a bad kid, all right? And my, my mother would sometimes just look at me from across the room and give me that mom look. That <laughs> I mean, I could, I could hear her eyes clicking and I knew what that meant. When I got home, hell hath no fury, right? Communication doesn't always have to be spoken, and I knew what she meant. 70% of all communication is misunderstood. That's kind of scary. Because you're sending that email to your constituent or even in-house, in and it's misunderstood because they don't have the voice inflection behind it which is why leaders talk to your people in person, right? Because it's misunderstood. Talk to your constituents, the person who's angry, bring them in for a meeting, have them talk to someone at the city that makes them feel like, or the county, that makes them feel like they're being listened to. Just don't shoot them an email. It can diffuse so many situations by properly communicating. If somebody wants to face-to-face -face meeting, Accommodate it, really, just accommodate it. They're, they're your constituents. 
Effective communication is defined as passing information between one person and another that's mutually understood. COVID did so many things to our society. And what it really did was cripple our communication style. Right? What it really did is it depersonalized everything. And we're still suffering from that. From that body language and body gestures. Eye contact is super important. When I'm talking with someone, I really like it if occasionally they look at me in my eyes because I know that they're talking. And I look at them in their eyes as well. I understand that there's some folkways, some cultural norms that uh, some societies will not look at you in the eyes and understand that's different. You have to understand culture as well. Body positioning within a space. If someone's sitting back by the door, they're constantly looking around, they look nervous, does it make you nervous? <laughs> yeah. The arm crossing, now, I, I, it's funny because whenever we sit and mention arm crossing, about half the people in the room, like, what do I do with my arms? I'm, not, I'm listening, right? But some, they do it with a look of defiance right on their face. It's like, oh my gosh. Because why? This is a defensive posture, right? It's a defensive posture. Just like those of you that had children or have children growing up, right? What did they do every time they were in trouble? They crossed their arms. This is true. Well, it, it can be, right? So she said, actually, isn't it about men? Because arm crossing for women means something else. It just depends, right? And it, it, it absolutely depends. I mean, it could be you know, a cultural thing. It might be a gender thing. But generally, and it's not always just about men. It can be. And, these, and what, I'm, what I'm getting at today are simply some signs to look at. It's a culmination of everything. It's not one isolated thing. De-escalation that you hear so much about is simply a pattern aimed at calming down your opponent. And maybe they're not your opponent in real life, but when we talk about opponent, I want you to have a, a fighting mindset when you feel like you're being prone or, or about to experience a violent encounter, because then they are your opponent. They're not your constituent anymore, they're your opponent. And in many cases, it's about survival. Because again, you represent government. And I cannot emphasize enough on how much anti-government rhetoric exists in our society. All the way down to local level, it's not just the federal level. I know that you have nothing to do with Congress. I know that you have nothing to do with who's in the White House, what's going on in, 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 in Washington. In some, some instances, you, you can't even control what's happening in our own state. You're only in control of your city, your town, that you're a leader of. But that doesn't matter to some people because you're government. You didn't fix my pothole. How many times have I not have I asked you to fix my pothole and it still hasn't been fixed? You don't care about me. Where's my tax dollars going? And you can explain it to them. <laughs> you can explain that there's not a lot of funding mechanism out there for roads in the state of Oregon, especially for small cities and towns. Right? You can explain that. That's just the way it's set up here in Oregon. It's escaping conflict situations altogether, and that's what de-escalation is. So you, when you're dealing with people that are angry, there's three types. Generally speaking, there's three types. There's that angry person that just screams and swears and threatens to abandon your services altogether. And some of you are like, fine, move, right? No. They do other things that people tend to do and say when they're angry. They're venting. They're just angry. They're venting. They just want something out of it. They want some result. I remember... One morning, I look out my office, and there's a guy with a don't tread on me flag with an AR-15 slung and a, and a handgun on, and he's walking back and forth down the sidewalk in front of City Hall. My first call was to who? 
Who would you call if that happened? First off, are they doing anything illegal? No. I didn't call the police because I was afraid. I wanted to know why, what happened, why this person might be out front because he wasn't coming inside City Hall. And they're like, oh, that's Russ. I won't say his last name. He's just, he's just that way. Well, what happened? Why is he, there's something happened with the city that he's walking in front of City Hall back and forth and pacing. And what it came out was the code enforcement officer had gone and put a bunch of those orange stickers on vehicles that he was working on that were in the city right away because the neighbor had complained, right? Pretty typical. He didn't like that. That's anti-government. I mean, in some cases, I mean, the code enforcement officer, I mean, he, he was actually out in the street, blocking part of the street with, with broken down vehicles. I mean, the city was completely in his right. He was mad. What do I do? I go and talk to him. Hey, can I help you? Well, yeah, I don't agree with the city ordinance and this and that and whatever. And we talked, and all that he wanted was to vent. That's all he wanted was to vent. Now, my background's a bit different, right? I mean, I can, maybe you're not comfortable going out and talking to someone like that. Maybe you want the police to show up out there. Understand that in our society right now, there's people that want the police to show up so they can have an antagonistic experience, right? Have you heard of First Amendment auditors? Who's not heard of a First Amendment audit? Okay, so a few of you. First Amendment audit is literally someone who comes in with a camera and is goading your city staff to call the police essentially so that there's a claim against the city for violating their First Amendment rights because they have the right to actually, believe it or not, to photograph you and to videotape you in a common place, in a common area. But again, talking sometimes, going back to this guy Russ, that's all he needed. Could it have potentially gotten worse? I actually do believe that over time, if I had not gone out and talked to him, that it would have gotten worse. The achiever are those people that they just want to see results. They don't really want to be angry. They just want something to happen, right? I mean, they, they really want that pothole fixed. Because every time they're stepping out of their, you know, every time they're, they're, they're leaving their driveway and going down the street, you know, it's knocking their car out of alignment. They just want to see results. They don't care how it's done. They just want it done. And they hit that fever pitch. And they just want that to make sure that the support staff or that, you know, they're supported in their needs uh, to get the job done. That's all they want. And that last category is a talker. These kind of people, uh, this need to vent. They come to you and they just want to vent. They, they're so angry. They just, again, want to vent. They're not outwardly angry where they're going to be carrying an AR-15 and doing all this, right? But they just want to vent. They're so upset. They just want to hear. And then they know maybe something can't be done, but they want to vent. I know all of you have had those kind of people in your offices already. They'll repeat everything about, I don't know, 100 times. And every time they see you, they will talk about it again. And those are the ones that you start avoiding. You're like, oh my gosh, there's Mr. Smith. <sighs> okay, I'm not going back in my office right now. I'm going to go around the block, right? You're laughing because you do this. When you're de-escalating a situation with somebody who's angry, maintain a safe distance from them. In law enforcement, we hear a lot about what's called the 21-foot rule. I'm just going to check my time here. Let me see where I'm at. We're good. Um, there's the 21-foot rule. Uh, and that's a lot of times geared towards uh, someone who might come at you with an edged weapon, right? Uh, it gives police officers the time to react. Uh, generally, you want to keep a good buffer zone of about five to six feet from someone uh, that's angry and start getting a little bit further away from them if you think that a violent attack is about to happen. Use a volume that's lower than uh, that of the aggressive individual. Um, speak relaxed if you can, in a non-threatening posture. That speaks volumes. Set limits. Be active in helping. Now we're going to talk about how can you prepare for an event 
within a public meeting that might be coming that you know is going to be heated. And you know your communities well. You don't know exactly know what it's going to be. It could be maybe ODOT, the big bad state, coming in to try to flex their muscles somehow. Right? It could be some tax that's, that's coming down. Maybe it's a water rate. Who knows what it is? But how do you prepare prior to? Well, understand that in the psyche of a person that you can't promise things that you cannot deliver. Do not make promises that you can't deliver on. That's first and foremost. Give a realistic expectation to your constituents of, of what really to expect that can help them solve a problem or alternatives that you have come up with. If they don't like the way the city's going to do something, listen. Is there another way that we can do that? If it's completely unavoidable, explain that, right? Explain what's going to be done and by whom and what the timeline is. And there will be more meetings. There's nothing wrong with setting an additional meeting to the public if they feel that they need it. They're your constituents, right? If you have a city manager that's like, no, these are for elected officials. If you have a city manager that's like, well, here's our timeline, and this is what the developer says, this and that, you are the governing body. You're the one that has to vote to approve a lot of this, right? If your constituents more t wants more time and they want more meeting within a feasible amount of time, what's wrong with that? Now, if you're up against a deadline, I get it. Maybe it's a funding deadline or a grant uh, deadline. But commit to a realistic time frame for uh, the actions that, that you agree upon. Intervene early. These are your do's and your don'ts up here. Intervene early. Show genuine concern. Because if somebody takes that time to come complain about something, that is the paramount top concern, even if for you it's a low-level concern because you're managing a city, you're worried about the budget, you're dealing with personnel issues, and they only care about the pothole being fixed. Show genuine concern for them. Speak in a calm and gentle voice. Be aware of your own body and the, the impression that you're giving them. Show genuine concern. Avoid using terms like why, or being passive or indifferent. Avoid touching and coming too close to the person. Some people do not like to be touched. It doesn't matter that you don't mind it. A lot of people don't like to be touched. Don't make judgmental comments. Don't show anger, take offense. Before your meeting, it's OK to remind the audience that you are going to follow procedural rules. A lot of times it's Robert's rules, right? You're going to adopt that. Many times it's in your charter. Add informal educational sessions if you need to, like we talked about. Move the issue to the top of your agenda. If you know it's a hot button topic, somebody make a motion to move it to the top of the agenda so we can get it done and over with. Provide access to information. Offer alternatives for commenting. Maybe they can't get it all out in three minutes that you've set, or five minutes that you've set for to call to the public. Make sure, and of course it's the law in Oregon now, that you have that option right, for your council session, for your public meetings to be um, multimedia, so people at home can enjoy that. Um, plenty of seating. Make sure there's plenty of seating there. There's nothing that gets people irritated so much they come in. There's no place to sit. If it's going to be a very large one and your council chambers can't, can't handle it, ask the high school if you know it's going to hold, hold a special session there or to hold your, your regular council session there. Just, just, note the, just give notice to the community. Greet attendees. Hey, how you doing? Hey, good for you to show up, whatever it is. Sign up sheet. Check your audio video equipment because that irritates people. They get there, they want to get on time. They don't want to see Cindy or, or Mary or, or, or Jim running around trying to make sure the AV equipment it looks unprofessional. And it makes it seem like you don't know what you're doing as a city or as a county. During the meeting, observe the rules. Right? Give an overview and an introduction. If you're the mayor and you're running the meeting, and, and for city managers, please remind your, your elected officials of this as, as well, uh, that there's ground rules. The worst thing that you can do in a heated, heated moment 
is allow all the call the public, the, the council meeting goes, and then somebody stands up at the end, I want to comment, and as the mayor, you allow that to happen, no bueno, right? Because that person has stewed the entire meeting and fireworks are gonna go off. Sorry, commenting period's over with. I'd be happy to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. Follow Robert's rules. Lead by example. Don't get in a back and forth dialogue with your constituents. Uh, speak, um, give them your full attention, explain the legal authority. If your city attorney needs to be there, so be it. Come prepared, take plenty of breaks. If you think that they need a break from the action, do it. When the meeting's all done, summarize the outcomes. Respond to questions or other issues, right? Um, maybe make a public statement. You know, maybe put a flyer with the next water bill, whatever. Communicate what steps the cities are gonna take. Uh, use email lists, ask, hey, if you, want me to, if you want to get on a list, sir, we'd be happy to send out an email for more information, right? Communicate. Many smaller communities fail to communicate with their constituents, and they feel that you're hiding something when you do. You can put it on Facebook, you can put it on the radio. You can say, well, why don't they go to council meetings that they want to know? Because people don't do that. You can airdrop things, and they still say they didn't get it. The last thing I'm going to go over, and I'm going to have you watch this real quick in the end of time, is run, hide, fight. They gave me an hour. I normally do this in four, okay? I'm going to say this before I forget about it. Um, if CIS insures you and you would like me to come and speak to your staff, uh, my schedule allows, I will absolutely do that to your city staff to help give them threat training. It's preferred if you have a competent police department, sheriff's office, to use them to find out how they would go about things. Sometimes they're super busy. I work with a lot of them. Sometimes I can train with them together. But I'm always willing to come out and do whatever um, I can to assist you. Um, the run, hide, fight, this is an FBI video about what you should do when a gunman comes, okay? Hi, can I get you started with drinks? Oh, sorry, I gotta take this. We'll need a minute. Man, you need to back up. You can't be here anymore. Get out of my face, what, man. You think I'm afraid of you? Get, get off, man. Man. I'm no victim. I'm ready for this. He's applying direct pressure to the wound to stop the bleeding until we can find a tourniquet. In the meantime, turn off your phones and make a plan to defend yourself. Where is he? 
We got him right here. Stay Please, down. show me your hands. Over here. You can survive a mass shooting if you're prepared. Remember, run, hide, or fight. Run. Wherever you go, be aware of alternate exits. Quickly and cautiously evacuate in a direction away from the attacker. Don't hesitate. Seconds matter. Remember windows and emergency exits. Leave belongings behind. Keep your empty hands raised and clearly visible when exiting a building. Follow all instructions from the police. Don't stop until you're sure you've reached a safe location. Hide. If there is no safe escape route, find a good hiding place. Lock and barricade the door. Silence cell phones. Prepare a defense plan. Fight. Fight only as a last resort. Use available objects as improvised weapons. Use teamwork and surprise. A coordinated ambush can incapacitate an attacker. You're fighting for your life. Don't fight fair. Stop the bleed. A victim can die of uncontrolled blood loss in five minutes or less. Apply pressure or a tourniquet to control severe bleeding. Go to fbi.gov slash survive to learn more. Okay. I, uh, <clears throat> you know, I've seen situations like this over the, over the span of a career, and I've also seen the courage of law enforcement. People say that's what they're paid to do. That's what they sign up to do and, and save lives. I get it. You don't necessarily do that. But if violence falls at your footstep, do everything you can to survive that incident. As a law enforcement officer for so many years, my goal was to go home at the end of my shift alive and unharmed. Didn't always go home un unharmed, but I always made it home alive. And I can tell you that that's the goal of every law enforcement officer because that's their mindset and that's their training. You don't necessarily expect to go to work ever to think that you're gonna encounter violence but if you do, run, hide, fight. Get the crap out of there if you can. Hide if you can't run away. And at the end of the day, fight. There's not as many police as there used to be. We all agree with that. And in an incident like this, you lose police officers for PTSD. Cause of do business now. I love this from Robert Kennedy. Each time someone stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out again on justice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. It's true. Do I have any questions from the audience? And I apologize for not giving more time for questions. Yes. Hi, I'm Kathy from Cascade Locks. We um, presently have a gentleman who has a long history of writing three, four page letters about his rights and, and everything. Um, he has now decided to start coming to council meetings because of a $4 increase over garbage services. And now all of a sudden the council, myself as mayor, we've become targets and I see him escalating. I work in health care so I'm done de-escalating and things like that, but I've been slowly watching him over the last probably two or three months, and I can see him to start ramping up. And so I just, what do you, I mean, he's the talker, he wants to vent, but also his body language is starting to change. So that's why I'm in this class, and I'm not really sure what to do. I know, number one, don't ever tell somebody, calm down. The minute you do that, you're going to make them matter. <laughs> but I just, I'm not sh quite sure what to do. But he's starting, like I said, his body language is getting more erratic. He's starting to make more and more threats. 
Any advice? Yes. Um, first off, Cascade Locks, Jordan Bennett, yeah. state administrator, good guy, really like him. Um, I uh, wanted, you know, in your situation, it's very common. And, and something like that, if you feel that the rhetoric is continued to increase beyond just that and you're starting to now feel afraid, no one has the right to instill fear in you on a repetitive basis. I would suggest since you don't have a police department, your, sign, you, your sheriff's office, contact them and let them know. Yes, there's a fine line between someone's ability to engage with their local government in threatening behavior. If there's no overt threat, you have to articulate what it is that's threatening about that individual and demonstrate that it continues to accelerate because that acceleration can then become a fever pitch and there's nothing wrong with the sheriff going to the sheriff's office, going over there and talking to them and saying, hey, you're very close. And if, if at all possible, you can always exclude them from coming in person with that threat. Remember, if your council meetings are available online, you can say you can't be here in person because we feel there's a threat. You can even go as far as and get an injunction against that person, if, if the, if the, especially if the court's granted. They're not prohibited from interacting within the, within their gov the local government because they can do it online now, right? Just uh, hit me up later if you have more questions and we can talk about it. Uh, just one, a couple more questions, yes. What about someone, what about someone who's, act the people who come to these active shooter events are not good upstanding citizens following your injunction orders and whatnot anyway. Right. And well, you may also have an issue with mental health situation which in our city do, the person is homeless and completely not taking medications and is not in contact with reality and is coming to every meeting and is going to everywhere. It just It's just such a hard thing. You can't talk sense into that or tell don't come back because that's where they live on your grounds. Yeah, um, so obviously you heard her. Um, it's, it's a difficult situation to sometimes be in when someone comes in, they're not, they're not always giving overt threats, but they just make you feel kind of threatened. We get this a lot of times, maybe someone's blocking the, 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 the doorway of a library and they're constantly talking to themselves. <laughs> Literally coming in. Yeah, I'm sorry? No, it's not. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 again, um, and thank you for the clarification. So if someone's coming in and continually threatening or threatening or harassing your employees. Again, your employees come to work, they don't come to work to be harassed all the time. And when there's harassing behavior that continues, again, get law enforcement involved because that could be a crime. And it is perfectly okay if somebody's coming in and harassing what should be an otherwise peaceful you know, operation, that they can be excluded from continuing coming in there. And that's not necessarily a mental health thing. If they, you have, you also have an obligation to your employees to keep them they're safe. So you know, there's that, you know, as well. So you know, get law enforcement involved. We can talk about that further too. If you would like to email me, I could do that. Um, are we done? Time's up. Okay. Uh, I appreciate all of you. Uh, an hour goes by super quick. Uh, my email again is up there on behalf of CIS. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Appreciate you. Great, thank you, thank you so much, Dan, for that amazing presentation, really appreciate it. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, please take a moment to provide us with feedback on today's session. Uh, I think you've all heard this, but you can do this by clicking the session in the conference app and then clicking on the feedback button. Uh, if you don't see that feedback button, add the se uh, session to your conference agenda through the app. So up next on today's conference program is a 30, 30 minute networking break followed by our final breakout sessions of the day starting at 3 p.m. 
Uh, the doors for the awards dinner open at 5.30 p.m. with dinner beginning at 6. If you are not registered to attend the awards dinner and would like to attend, please visit the registration de uh, desk at the next room and check ticket availability. So thank you everybody for joining us today, uh, this afternoon, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.